I want to take the next at least two weeks to look at the family. Maybe longer than that, but I'm not sure yet. So we look this morning at Psalm 103, verses 8 through 14 trying to understand how is it that we, as God's people, can cultivate a cheerful home. But before we read our passage and get into the sermon, let's pause and ask God's blessing on the time as we've gathered around His Word. Father, we come to You as a people who exist because of Your Word. Father, You create all things, both this world and Your church, through, through speaking, your word brings life. And Father, we are not foolish to think that while we needed your word to create our life, we can go about our life in sustaining it in our own strength and in our own power. Father, we humbly acknowledge before you this morning that we need your word to continue, to persevere to continue repenting and continue believing, to continue following Christ. And Father, as we think about our homes and wanting them to be places that are cheerful, that we can truly say, home sweet home. Father, we need Your truth. We need Your character. If we are to be the people You have called us to be, if we are to have the homes that you desire for us to have. So Father, I pray that as we look at your word this morning, that you would empower it to perform the work that needs to be accomplished this morning. Father, we are, we are under no delusion that we can somehow create here what needs to be created. So Father, we humble ourselves as your children and we ask for your help. And we ask for it in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. When was the last time that you danced through the puddles in the pouring rain with your kids? Husbands, when was the last time that you surprised your wife on a bright spring morning with a breakfast date to her favorite cafe? Wives, when was the last time that you planned that weekend trip for the big game so that you and your husband could be alone on that trip? Getting a little nervous? If I were sitting where you were, I would be nervous too. You see, this is often the advice that we get about having a cheerful home. That cultivating a cheerful home has to do with these special little things or these big things that we do for one another. It's all about this. If you take the advice of what you can find in newspaper columns and daytime talk shows and Sadly, even in much Christian literature. But the reality is, we can get all the advice in the world about date nights, reading to your kids, and scheduling priorities, and some of it can be very helpful. But at the end of the day, you can have all of that and really miss the point that the Bible makes about having a cheerful home. You see, Scripture instruction cannot begin and end with sort of the slogan to slow down and smell the roses. Again, though that can be a helpful thing, that's not where the Scripture begins and the Scripture ends. God knows that a home is where multiple sinners gather under a single roof. And He understands the chaos that we are bent toward cannot be fixed by mere relational tips that you could read in the USA Today newspaper. And as Christians, we cannot foolishly sort of baptize that tips and psychology with a little Bible verses sprinkled on top. 
when we look at the state of homes in our culture, even in our neighborhoods here in Ankeny that have tidy home, excuse me, tidy lawns that are fertilized and kept neat, sadly within these homes there is a decay from the inside. Homes that are kept together simply out of convenience, but where there is not cheerfulness, sweetness, kindness. And some places don't even pretend to have family unity. Anyone who has any experience with foster care knows how often a child's home is the saddest and most dangerous place they could be. Anger, strife, selfishness often pervade homes. And there is nothing sweet or cheerful about many homes. So how can we as Christians cultivate a cheerful home? Well, I believe that a home that is cheerful is one where the character of God is displayed inside its walls. The key to a cheerful home is to adopt the same disposition that God has toward His own family. We are required to be possessed, to have God to occupy our lives so that we can live in cheerful homes. Now there's a couple of different approaches that we can take to what the Bible says about home living. The first and most common approach that are often taken by Christians and pastors is to look at the direct instruction in the Scripture on families. You can look at places like Ephesians chapter 5, Colossians chapter 3, Deuteronomy chapter 6, where there is explicit direct instruction on how marriage is to function and how parents and children should relate. Another option is to consider passages that have indirect assumptions about the family. So for example, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says, even evil fathers know how to give good gifts to their children. Matthew chapter 10, Jesus says, whoever loves anyone more than me, whether it's father, mother, daughter, son, more than me is not worthy of me. So again, the instruction isn't directly on how the home ought to function, but based on the analogies that Jesus Jesus uses, you can pick up on what ought to happen, that fathers ought to give good things to their children, that the family is the closest human bond. But another way at looking at what the Scripture says about family is to consider those passages where God's character or God's disposition, that is, the inclination of His heart, is displayed in familial terms. God uses the images of the family to instruct us on how He is. The intimacy, the security, the closeness of divine relationship, and by looking at that, we can learn about the family from the analogies that Jesus gives to us of Himself, and also when we look, as we will today, in the Old Testament. And So what I want to do this morning is cast a vision of God's attitude toward you as a believer. And the goal is that you will be captured by this vision of of God's attitude, His disposition towards you, and as you see that, that truth of God's disposition towards you, you will adopt that disposition towards those who are in your family. Whether you are here this morning and you are a married couple with kids, or whether you're a single person who is a part of a larger family, or even perhaps you're just roommates, The instruction here of seeing how God's attitude towards you should instruct your attitude toward other people. And in particular, for this sermon, the application is more based on those who were in close familial relationships. So there are three particular dispositions that God has toward His own family that I think by looking at and then applying those inclinations that God has towards us, thinking about how that ought to affect how we act towards those in our own family. 
The first disposition that God has towards His family is that God is unwavering in His love. God is unwavering in His love. We get this from Psalm 103 and verse 8, but I'm going to begin by reading the entire passage here. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will He keep His anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His steadfast love towards those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does He remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear Him. For He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Our first point there, that God is unwavering in His love, comes from a number of passages here, but particularly there in verse 8, the psalmist writes, The Lord is merciful and gracious. He is slow to anger and He is abounding in steadfast love. This abounding in steadfast love is a familiar phrase to the Israelites. It was basic to their understanding of God. So the audience here that would be listening to this is familiar with this language. That God is tender to those who approach Him with their need. He is gracious. He is slow to anger. He is full of compassion as a father shows compassion to his own children. So God shows compassion to those who fear him. He has an unwavering commitment to his kids. We saw there in verse 8, he is abounding in steadfast love. Verse 11, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear Him. Like the biggest hearted dad you can imagine, time and time again, God is kind to those who don't deserve it. As we think about just in God's dealing with His people in the nation of Israel, and time and time again, their own rebellion, their own disobedience, God doesn't just wipe His hands and start over. He is abounding in steadfast love. He shows compassion to His children. Even when we move into the time of the church and you sit down and read the history of the church over the last 2,000 years and you see all the sin and you see even the great heroes of the Christian faith with their flaws and their, their problems... And the disobedience in our, even in our own day, in our own churches. And we see that God is steadfast in His love. He is unwavering in His commitment to His children. When you look at your own life, how many times you have approached God saddened, overwhelmed, overburdened, And yet God was steadfast in His love toward you. He showed compassion. He loved you. You see, God's faithful love is so abundant that the psalmist compares it to the distance between the heaven and earth. This is an insurmountable distance for us. Think about it. If you were to just stand outside and to try to to grab the sky, this is something that, that we cannot do. You have more of a chance of reaching up and grabbing the sky than you do of God faltering in His commitment of steadfast love to you as His child. As we think about this, As believers, God's heart toward us is overflowing with tender concern. And He has most proven this in His willingness to send His own Son to die a death for us so that we could be reconciled to Him. No circumstance, 
No failure, no sin can separate us from the love of God that is towards us in Christ Jesus. So this loving and tender disposition serves as the basis of all of our explicit instruction for families. When you think about when the Bible gets really clear of what should happen in a home, the ability to do that is based on God's own loving disposition towards us. He doesn't ask us to do something that He Himself does not do. So in Colossians 3, when husbands are not to be harsh with their wives, but as Ephesians 5 says, to treat them tenderly and to nourish and cherish her. How can we do that? Because God is unwavering in His love to us. When the apostle instructs that fathers are not to provoke or be harsh with their children, but encourage and teaching them the word. You see, God's disposition towards us should influence our disposition towards one another. We often talk, there are many sermons that are preached about how love is a committed sacrifice for the good of others. And that is a biblically faithful statement. But there are very little sermons and talk about how biblical family love involves warmth and tenderness, feelings of affection for one another. It's not just this rough and tough, gritted determination to sacrifice. It is that. But there's also another side that we see here modeled by God in Psalm 103. You see, coldness between members of a family, especially that of a husband and wife, are an indication that hearts are not loving one another as God loves us. The absence of fondness and desire for one another means something is wrong with our commitment. Imagine, if you would, a a wife who is ice cold, to her husband as she takes care of business outside of the home, as she keeps the house in order, as she beautifully meets the needs of her family. But she's ice cold. Imagine a husband who dutifully provides for his family, but doesn't make an emotional investment in his wife or his kids. He doesn't think about them. When he's with them, or when he's not with them. Imagine parents who provide all the food and the latest clothes and gadgets for their kids, but there's no stirring of affection or delight when their kids come into the room. You see, if affection If an unwavering love and desire for one another is missing, then love isn't operating optimally. You see, because God's heart is not just full of sacrificial love, it is full of affection, it is full of compassion, it is full of tenderness for His family. And the more like God you are, the more you will love your family as God loves His own family. If God delights in His family, then we must delight in our own. And of course, the question then is, how do we do this? How is it that we are, it's possible for us to have an unwavering love towards those in our family? Well, I believe John gives us the hint in 1 John 4 where he says, we love... Why? Because He first loved us. You have to remember that as believers, we have been adopted into the family of God. We have been given the type of love we are to express to others by God Himself. And this love equips us. You see, God's love isn't just an example to follow. We don't look and say, oh, this is how God loves, and so we should love just like Him. That is true, but His love is more than just an example or a model to follow. His love is equips us. His love fills us and enables us to love just as He loves us. 
In Ephesians 5, the Apostle Paul says, Be imitators of God. And then he gives this phrase, As beloved children. Imitate God as children who are loved by God. It is God's love of us, His disposition, His inclination of unwavering love towards us that enables us to imitate that same love we receive, we can give it to other people, particularly our spouse and those within our family. So we have to ask, why is this type of unwavering love often hindered? Well, one of the greatest hindrances to this type of loving affection, this unwavering love, is when our affections are strongest for things outside the home. Think about a man who is, seeks fulfillment in his career. He wants to be successful, which there's nothing wrong with that desire, but that commitment to that, a greater affection for that success in their career will not be helped by a bunch of energetic kids who are clamoring for his attention, who will prevent him from pursuing his success perhaps in the way he wants. Another thing we can think of is even something more spiritual, where we can become so devoted to our pursuit of God thinking that through reading the Bible and reading books about God and spending time in prayer, and yet come out of that time cold towards our family. We're, we're really in that moment not loving God, but a knowledge about God or being perceived as spiritual. You see, you can't, you cannot, how, how can this, as, as John says, how can we love God if we do, who we cannot see if we do not love our brother whom we can see? You see, cultivating affection for our family requires pursuing the members of our family. As you and I deny ourselves and seek the good of other members of our family, the Holy Spirit will give us a wholehearted affection for, for them. And so we must do the work of pursuing, not mechanically, but beginning in a repentant way of a, of a half-hearted affection, of not a true unwavering love and commitment. And so I ask you, Husbands and wives this morning, are you warm and compassionate towards one another? Do you look on one another with kindness, a tenderness that invites, that believes the best about your spouse? What if I ask your spouse that question? Why don't you ask them this afternoon? And start a conversation. You must pursue one another in the marriage relationship, but parents must also pursue their kids. They must praise their kids. It's not self-esteem that is helpful to children, but convincing our children of our fondness of them, our unwavering love for them is unshakable. That even in their sin and their failure, they cannot make our love for them falter. You see, self-esteem means very little for a child's security. But being loved with a never-failing affection, that means everything for their security. And isn't this how God loves us? You see, we rob our children when we show no delight in them, when our disappointment or annoyance of them crowds out the regular displays of affection for them. Dads, as we think about dealing with our own sons, 
They must know that we delight in them. We're fond of them. We love them. Our daughters should know that we desire them. We love them. We find them beautiful. Mothers, your sons will feel secure when they know your affection for them. Delight in them as little boys. And as they grow older, express confidence in them as they age. Grow your daughters to be close companions to you. And even outside of the, the marriage relationship, even outside of dealing with your own kids, you think about the fact that many of us in here are siblings. We have siblings. Some of us know the role of being an annoyance to an older brother or sister, and some of us know the guilt of being the mean older brother or sister. But we can't, over, we can't underestimate how important these sibling relationships are even as we grow to adults. We should be committed to showing delight in our brothers and sisters as we reflect, as we show God's own inclination towards us and the unwavering commitment we show to those in our family. The second disposition that God has towards His own family is that God is patient with sin. I get this from verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will He keep His anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. You see, God's willingness to withhold deserved rejection. He's willing to do that. A number of times in the Old Testament, we see that God withholds His judgment. He withholds His anger, though it is justifiable. Though He is just and right in giving it out. And so what the psalmist is teaching is that God, who has a right to judge us for our sins, He is not irritable. He is not easily annoyed. He is not quick to pass judgment and to lash out in anger. Brothers and sisters, God is not moody or unapproachable. And we must think about what an incredible blessing it is that that is our Heavenly Father. That Christians, you do not have to fear that God is in a bad mood when you approach Him. You don't have to fear that when you come in repentance that He is going to hold on to your sin against Him in bitterness and make sure to remind you of it a time and time again. That is a remarkable truth about God's disposition towards us. He is slow to anger. He does not always chide. He does not keep His anger long. It is a statement of God's readiness to cease His wrath, to withhold His judgment, even to those who who deserve it. And brothers and sisters, if God is willing to let go of His anger because of the cross of Christ, shouldn't we be willing to release our own anger? Because you see, our anger and God's anger are two different things. God's anger is right, and His right emotive response to what is wrong or to what is morally outrageous. He is correct to be angry every time. But most of the time, that is not our anger. Mostly, our anger is an emotive response to what we prefer to see as wrong or what we prefer to be offended by. It is in other words, if we don't see what we want to see, we get angry. And what we want to see isn't typically based on God's standard of what we want to see, but our own preference. But here's how sly we are. Typically, what we want to see is just close enough that we feel being justified in being angry for a while. So a husband justifies his explosive anger at his wife because she isn't showing him the respect. After all, that's what the Bible teaches. A brother justifies hitting his sister 
because she took something that was his. Don't you know, Mom, stealing's wrong. It's in the Bible. And so I'm justified in my impatience, in my anger towards my sister. A wife feels right in fuming quietly at the inconsideration of her husband. Because after all, my husband is supposed to lay down his life for me. An adult daughter feels justified in holding on to bitterness because it was wrong of her mother to treat her that way for so many years. But you see, if God, who has the right to be angry, is slow to anger and quick to release His anger, how much more should we be patient in our own homes? So I ask you, as I have to ask myself, are you irritable? Is your home an angry place? Then, brothers and sisters, there is a need for repentance. Not excuse-making. Not twisting the commands of Scripture to justify your unjustifiable anger and impatience. And not just a repentance over the anger, but for what in our heart we wanted so bad that we failed to display the own inclination we want God to show us being patient with sinners... We've set that aside because it's more important that we get what we wanted or we see happening what we wanted to see happen. You see, a quickness to get irritated and a tendency to hold on to anger are signs that God's disposition towards you are not your dispositions towards your family. Notice verse 10. He does not deal with us according to our sins nor repay us according to our iniquities. Do you realize what would happen to us if God treated us according to our sins, according to our iniquities? The reality is we would all be dead. None of us would be alive if God handed out what we rightly deserve because the penalty of sin is death. So how can God choose not to treat us as we deserve? How can He not repay us according to our sins and our iniquities? Well, the fact is that He sent His Son to die for us, that Christ rightfully paid the penalty for our sin. He died upon the cross. And as we trust in Christ and His work on our behalf on the cross, we will not be dealt with as we deserve. This truth is is the basis of all of our hope and joy as a Christian, that God's disposition toward us changed from anger to acceptance. From judgment to reconciliation and to reception. And so now, God is radically forgiving. Are you? What is the air in your home? Does your home deal with others according to their sins? And repay them according to their iniquities? Or does your home deal with others according to the gospel? How do you talk about other people in front of your own children? Because the reality is, you are teaching your children how to deal with people according to their sins or according to the charitable judgments of the gospel. Wives, do you think primarily of your husband in terms of his sin? Has he done something that has deeply hurt you? Then bring it up to him. From a heart that is ready to forgive and not a heart that's ready to condemn with a gotcha. That's not how God deals with you. and Therefore, that should not be your disposition towards your husband. Husbands, are you quick to express disappointment with your wife? Is there a thing that you're not, not aware about her own shortcomings? Do you treat her accordingly? You see, brothers and sisters, God, forgive us. God, forgive us for saying, Lord, don't treat us according to our sin. Be patient with our shortcomings. But then we turn and we're going to hold people accountable for theirs. We're not going to show patience. 
You know what that's called? Hypocrisy. Brothers and sisters, that is in every heart in this room. That's why we need grace. Parents, do your interactions with your kids orbit around their sin? You can feel this way as we seek to parent our children. But I ask you, are you building a context where you are communicating a disposition of love and patience, where when discipline is needed, it will be received? Or are your kids so hardened off to your discipline because mom and dad can never be pleased? They don't know how to be patient with my sin and my rebellion. Verse 12 tells us that as far as the east is from the west, so far does He remove our transgressions from us. Now you have to remember in David's day, he didn't have Google Maps, right? We know that eventually if you go west and you go east, you'll meet at a point. David didn't know that. And so in his mind, these things are, you're just, you continually move away from each other when you do that. And so David's saying, God separates you entirely from your sin. He remembers it no more. And oh, to have this disposition in our homes. How much grief would people be spared? How much relational destruction could be prevented if we learned to separate sin as far as the east is from the west? to remember it no more, to be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. You may have been told before to forgive and forget, but it's impossible to forget most of the time. And so you should forget about forgetting because the reality is you most likely will never forget. But the point is this, that you release your family members of the guilt associated with their sin. You don't hold on to it against them. It isn't allowed to create distance in the home. You don't punish them with coldness or expectations that they'll just do it again. You don't interpret every action in light of that hurt or that sin against you. You see, that's what it means to cast sin as far as the east is from the west. You treat your families and their sin that they've repented of, there's the qualifier, as as distant as the east is from the west, as as distant from your own home. So we've seen the first two dispositions. God is an unwavering in His love and how that ought to affect our disposition towards those in our family. We secondly saw that God is patient with sin and therefore we likewise ought to be patient with the sin of others. And then lastly, we see that God is understanding of weakness. He's understanding of weakness. Where you saw patience with sin, now you see sort of a, a change here of to the weakness of the person. And I get this, excuse me, in verse 14. For He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. To me, this is the most, was the most helpful verse in, as I was studying this passage. We close with this. God knows our frame. He, he knows how we came to be, and He knows all the limits that come with being made of dust. God knows that we are dependent creatures, that we are needy, that we are frail, that we are finite, we are limited. So the picture here is God is a tender father who is aware of his frail children, a father who is aware of a certain task that their five-year-old child can't do. It's just part of their weakness of being a five-year-old child. Brothers and sisters, we are beset with weakness. We live in a corrupted world. 
God knows that we get confused, that we get fatigued, that we're doubtful, and we become discouraged. He knows the particular ways in which we get stuck. And if you're in Christ this morning, this is God's disposition to you. He is sympathetic that you are made of dust. Sympathetic towards your weakness. He does not expect of you what you cannot deliver. And this is good news to that perfectionist that is in all of us. That you and I have incapacities and weaknesses. And God knows them thoroughly so that we don't have to continue pretending that we're strong and independent. And that we don't need God's all-encompassing grace. If a perfect God shows understanding of weakness, then think about what this means for our own homes. This aspect of God's disposition towards the family is the reason for the instruction in 1 Peter 3, verse 7, where it says, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Atten- excuse me, understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Live with her in an understanding way. God remembers our frame, that we are of dust. And Paul instructs parents not to, not to be harsh with their children, to not discourage them or to provoke them to anger. You're remembering the frame of that child, who they are. So the reality is, let's not be heavy-handed with them. And so our families should be marked with a consideration for one another. And as husbands, we have to lead in this task. Uh, are, Are we aware of our own wife's frame? Are we aware of what she can handle and that we don't put expectations on her, or are we are we also not expecting too little of her? We're considering who she is, that she's an individual. She's not like every other woman. She's our wife. We consider our frame, and we are understanding of the weaknesses that she has as a person. Wives, are you considerate when you set your expectations of your husband? He has certain personality tendencies. Maybe he's not as outgoing as you want. Maybe he's not the bulldog leader that you wished he would be, or vice versa. But part of this is knowing that he is dust. What do you expect of dust? And so we can be patient with one another when we realize that is our frame. That is our makeup. When we think about parents dealing with their children, we have to have a sense of our child's weakness and frailty. Where is she at in her growth and tendency? What are his strengths and his weaknesses? And we must parent each child according to that. Not this sort of textbook expectation we got from a robot manual, right? We can't treat kids that way. Your child's not a robot. And despite false teachers out there, they're not an animal that you can sort of shape their will. That's not taking into consideration their frame. We think about parenting a one-year-old and not expecting of a one-year-old what you would expect of a five-year-old. That's provoking children to anger. That's not considering their frame. When you understand a teenager and the changes that take place as a child becomes an adult, there is, require a lot of consideration and patience. Perhaps your child doesn't display the intelligence that you did. Maybe they're not as athletic as you are. Maybe you think they're too talkative or maybe you think they're too shy. You have to take into consideration when setting expectations for children. Remember their frame. Do not expect higher things of your children than God expects of you. Sometimes as parents, we are more demanding than God is. And that is sin. One of my greatest fears for this church 
Because in 10, 15 years, we're going to have a lot of children who we didn't consider their frame, and they are going to rebel against God and His gospel. And it will lay at our feet. Maybe you're here and your child has some form of disability. Your wish was that she was normal. How can the parents of normal children understand what you're facing? And the reality is they may never understand. But this text says God understands. He knows what it is to be, to, to condescend and to patiently endure trial of giving himself to frail and weak children. And God will never stop sustaining you as you care for your own precious gift that he has given to you. The last application I could think of on this particular thought that God understands our weakness. Or for those of us here who are perhaps Adults who are dealing with aging parents or aging grandparents. That I remind you to consider their weaknesses, their frailty. Most likely they are aware that their prime years have passed. And there's a tendency to want to cling to what is most precious in their life. You get extra phone calls. You get guilt trips about seeing you more. Part of loving them is not getting impatient with them, but remembering their frame, showing tenderness, giving them the extra time that's possible, and reflecting God's disposition to you as He remembers your frame. You remember theirs as they age. My desire for this church is to have a church full of cheerful homes. Pop psychology won't create that. Many believe it will and they go on to disappointment. But brothers and sisters, if we remember God's own tendencies towards us, He loves us with an unwavering love. He is patient with our sin and our failure, and God is understanding of the weakness of our composition. If we think about how God has treated us, and oh, how thankful we are that He is patient with our sin, that He understands our weakness, that He is committed to us despite our sin and our weakness with an unwavering love, and we reflect on that truth, it will change how we interact with our spouse. It will alter how we interact with our siblings and our parents and to our own children. And we will be able to look and see that God, as we cast our vision upon Him, is creating a place of His own family, heaven itself, inside the four walls of our own house. May God make it so. Let's pray. Father, we thank You Lord, anytime we begin to think about our relationships, especially those closest to us, it is easy to be overwhelmed by our own sin. Lord, we, we blow it every day. And Father, we, we stand in need of grace upon grace upon grace. And Father, may we never be a people who stop seeking that grace, who stop seeking that forgiveness for where we fall short. And Father, may we never lose hope that your demand is not perfection, but that we continue persevering in loving those that you have given closest to us. Father, these things of being patient with sin and understanding of weakness and an unwavering love, Lord, we, we, we need Your help. We're thankful that You model that for us and that, Lord, that You supply the strength for us as Your children 
to give those same characteristics and dispositions towards those that you have put closest to us. Father, make this a reality in our lives. Lord, give us, help us to pursue it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.